Okay, I'm gonna try it. Let's do it. Okay. Hello, and welcome to the News from the Real World podcast, where we discuss articles posted on the PTM Green page about news and happenings from around the world of arts and entertainment. I'm joined today by Dale Harris, graduate third year technical director and assistant master electrician. Good morning. Laura Mills, third year scenic designer and artisan. Hello. Margot Gray, first year director extraordinaire. Hello. And I'm just Matt Rohner, third year graduate technical director. The articles will be found on the website posted in the video below. And uh, if you're on Twitter, you can uh, comment, use the hashtag NFTRW. Let us know what you think. All right, guys, let's start it off. First article this week is titled, Judge Rules That It's Illegal to Sell Custom Batmobiles Because the Batmobile is Itself a Fictional Character. This is written by Lauren Davis, writing from io9.com. This was one of our editor-suggested picks. So there's a guy, his name is uh, Mark Twale. He owns a small business in California. Um, he does custom body work and custom cars. It's called Gotham Garage. So he makes kits and makes uh, full fabricated cars. Um, from different movies, um, one of the main draws he has is Batmobiles. He does three different Batmobiles. He does the 60s Adam West Batmobile, the 1989 uh, Batmobile, and the Batman Forever Batmobile. So DC Comics heard about this, took him to court, and said, you can't be making these Batmobiles. And here's what the judge had to say. He said that this Gotham Garage was uh, copywriting a pictorial graphical work, but also, interesting enough, that his making custom cars violated the copyright of the character of the car. So if you read the student comments on this article, there was a lot of debate as to if the Batmobile was a character, can a character be copyrighted? So I'm going to open up the table to you guys. What do you think? Is a non-physical object a character? I'm going to appeal to the director of the group right now, and Margo, because I think your opinion... My, my opinion counts. Yes. Um, well, here's, here's what I think. If you can call, say, say you've got the Lone Ranger, right? His horse is silver. Is silver a character? I would say yes. yes. Okay, I would say that the Batmobile is the Batman equivalent of silver. And so I, I, can, see some, I can see some reasoning can why the Batmobile is a draw a line that the Batmobile is an inanimate object and silver at least has some inanimate... A bean about okay, him. Okay, what about what about Kit in Knight Rider? Kit speaks. A lot of people talked about Kit, and Kit yeah. has a point of view, Michael. So, so he's a character for sure. Yes. So it's not his his being a car that prevents being a car doesn't prevent you from being a character. So the horse, what's the horse's name? Silver. Silver, Silver and Kit further the plot. By themselves. So does the Batmobile. The Batmobile can't do anything by itself. It can't. Yeah, but it is a vehicle for Batman to do things. <laughs> but like it's soldier. a vehicle. It's a vehicle for Batman to do things. It's an accessory. It's a prop. But it's integral to the story. Without it, the Batmobile, how does Batman get anywhere? There are lots of props that are integral to the story. The Little Wonder in Oklahoma is an integral prop to the story. How that obscure is that? But it's not a character. <laughs> well, I, I, I want to jump off on that because I was trying to think of non or non personal, you know, non-people things in plays that are characters. And we talk a lot about the the other character on stage being the set, right. right, or the set design. So I was trying to think of things, and I was thinking maybe the chair from Sweeney Todd is another character, mm -hmm. uh, the tree in Waiting for Godot, perhaps, um, the church tower in Ibsen's Master Builder, how's that for a reference, wow. might be another yeah. character. So like, I think there's repercussions for our world, because if these things are becoming characters and subject, subject to copyright, where do we draw the line for our industry, our art. I mean, I, those areas to me are really separate. As a scenic designer, I don't feel like the you know the, the rules that govern character definition are have any risk of, of overflowing into scenery. But the the test for a character, for instance, if you're writing um, a novel and you want to have uh, Don Draper appear in your novel, right? Uh, you you could. You probably couldn't do that. It would be very risky to do that because once once he starts behaving like Don Draper, you can mention him. That's fair use. Um, but but once he starts to behave like Don Draper, then you're in trouble. So it's like what the test of a character apparently is recognizable behavior. And I think you could argue that the Batmobile <laughs> has recognizable behavior. Right, and it was very clear. Like <laughs> this is the Batmobile. It's no mistake. And uh, he makes other cars too. The the car from the Munsters. Mm -hmm. Uh, the Love Bug, uh, the Mach 5 from Speed Racer. So these are recognizable things based on their characteristics. Yeah. 
I mean, I, I think it's, and the article said no matter what, even if even if this character thing doesn't come to pass, there's still trademarks, trademark infringement involved. I'm fine with the trademark and the copyright of, you know, the, the visual image of it, but it's not a character. It does not make decisions. It does what about, not... What about Herbie? Herbie moves <laughs> on its own. Herbie moves as an, an, an So an under object. law, you would define Herbie as a character, but not the Batmobile? Because Herbie, you can tell Herbie is making choices to affect the outcome of a situation. The Batmobile is not making choices, and directing and characters are all about... Choices. The horse makes a choice, the car kit makes a choice, the Batmobile does not make choices, not a character. So it sounds like there's deeper existential <laughs> issues at work here, which we'll put aside for the sign. Uh, another copyright <laughs> issue which showed up on the green page this week was uh, schools and copyrights. Lauren, why don't you tell us about that? So this is a student pick from techdirt.com. Uh, the article is titled, Campaign Launched to Stop School from Claiming Copyright on Student Work. Uh, so the school board of uh, the Prince, Prince George County is considering a policy that would claim the copyright um, of all work produced by students and faculty uh, on their campus. Um, this is dangerous. Uh, how do you guys see this influencing work, especially at a high school level? This is a high school district that we're talking about here. Well, it uh, includes all of their schools, right? Elementary yeah. schools. Well, yeah, so, the, yeah, so the district. The whole thing. Here was my first question. There was a lot to read about why this is a bad idea, and we'll mm -hmm. get into that. But mm -hmm. I would like to hear some defense of why would they do this? What, what is the reason for copywriting? Everything. So the first grade, she's making the money sign with yes, her hand. This is, this if is you're not money. watching, <laughs> Margo money is because uh, uh, it suggests that what they really want to cash in on is employee-developed curriculum. Mm -hmm. Because of all these apps that people have now to develop curriculum, if their teachers develop curriculum, they can sell that and make money. Except that it seems like they have phrased their claim rather too broadly. That is this commercial. Case. I can't talk. Commercializing education in a way that I think is completely against everything that it stands for. Well, it's still. I mean, that's a, a curriculum is a huge industry. Oh yeah. People buy and, and textbooks are a huge oh, industry. Yeah. So I mean, it already exists. I think this is just the school district looking to cash in on what. But their do you want are pressure doing. at that level in the educational system? I to, don't. Well, yeah. But they do, because okay. because these cash. I mean, it's a public school district, right? Mm -hmm. They're strapped for cash. They think to themselves, how can we make money off of what our teachers are already doing? Because as it's, as it's phrased now, probably a teacher could develop a curriculum for their class and then sell it and keep the money themselves. So to widen this conversation, a lot of the response from the students' comments and from there was a website that was posted called Don't Copyright Me mm -hmm. was all from the student perspective. Mm -hmm. The employees, and this is where I want to draw a distinction, the employees of the school district are developing this product as an employee of the district. So we talked a couple weeks ago about playwrights writing for a movie or for a play and they don't have the copyright. That would be the same thing. So I'm going to go with the school. That if you're a teacher that I am paying you money for and you develop something to work in a class that I am paying you for, I get the copyright for that product that you've already been compensated for as a teacher. I think if you're doing it all on school time and all with school materials, then yes. I think the the problem here is that the way that this is phrased, if I wrote a curriculum for my class in my spare time on my own computer, the district claims that it owns that too. And that's what I find problematic is that it's, it's claimed a bit too broadly. Like CMU, for example, talks about uh, in, in its copyright policy talks about uh, its its contribution to a project. If it contributes more than a certain dollar amount um, to the project, at, at, and then it has to inform the people in the project mm -hmm. that it is planning to to have be involved in that copyright, and then there's certain percentages of who gets what mm -hmm. in that. But it's but it's all about informing the people and making sure that people know what is owned and what CMU's contribution was versus what the individual contribution was. So I, I think the, the main problem here is that this is just phrased in a ridiculously broad way so, um, as, so as to own like preschoolers' finger paintings. Yeah, I think the, 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 what made this so scary was that it, it was very broad in general language. So like a lot of student comments said, what, what do they want with my you know, geometry homework that I'm going to do? Mm -hmm. But I think even taking it a step further, applying it to CMU specifically, is we have playground here. Right, so playground, now it's not a class, but it's using drama resources, uh, drama time, uh, drama materials sometimes, and students develop work, and a lot of this, this work has a future outside of these walls. So does CMU own the stuff that Pigpen did a couple years ago that's now you know, in New York? Um, I don't know. Like, I mean, I actually looked this up. Um, under Carnegie Mellon's policy, uh, any work that is developed, um, again, without significant 
significant contribution by the university is still owned by the individual who created it. Um, that includes choreography, that includes music, that includes all of what we do, basically. Pantomime. Pantomime. Um, cited pantomime. It so is. although we do use School of Drama resources, we are still protected uh, in that we, we still do own the work. I think the troubling attitude here is that the article talked about this too, the idea of an ownership society, that all ideas and information can and should be owned. Mm -hmm. And I think as an artist, that's really troubling to me, the increasing tendency to copyright every little thing and to commodify mm -hmm. every little idea and image and thought um, so, so that they're not um, free for use, especially in an educational setting. I find that really troubling. Mm -hmm. Certainly troubling, and I think it's a good reminder that you know, even though copyright is very gray and no one likes talking about it, it's, there's greater implications to it, so it's definitely worth mentioning. But when you think about it, why create something that can be copyrighted today when you can create something that can be copyrighted tomorrow? Oh. <laughs> well, a brilliant transition into this article about procrastination, which was from the website Lifehack and written by Hoi Wan. And we are all students, and a lot of us struggle with procrastination. I also know a few of our faculty members struggle with procrastination. It is a ubiquitous thing, and there are lots of articles that we've read about it. The interesting thing about this article is it has this really cool uh, word picture, simile, analogy. Do you have one? I got a picture of it right here. Uh, it talks about there are two parts of your brain. There's the Albert Einstein part, and here's a picture of Albert Einstein. And that is the logic part of I'm thinking, I'm planning, I know it's good for me to do this assignment early and on time, and I'll get better work, and I'll sleep better. Then there is a dinosaur or a lizard called Rex, and that is the animalistic part of us that needs food and needs water and needs to watch Gilmore Girls. Then this is what, so in our minds, we're like, oh, I want to be Albert and make good decisions, but then the little Rex monster always circumvents the decision. So the picture is the Rex driving the car and Albert Einstein in the back just following him wherever he goes. It's so a Lauren Mills original. Yes, Lauren Mills, which is now copyrighted because she wrote her name on it. It gave five points to help overcome. I thought they were useful. I'll go through them real quick. Forget logic. You can't logically overcome procrastination because, as you see in the picture, Rex is more powerful. Uh, comfort matters. You have to take care of yourself with sleeping correctly, eating correctly, to be in a good place to be able to do the work. Uh, nurture discipline, which means you have to slowly develop the discipline of doing it. You just can't to psych yourself into it, you have to practice. Incite emotion, so psyching yourself up for it. Force yourself to start, and then control your environment. So, you know, shut down your social media programs, put yourself in a place where you won't be distracted. These are all very good tips, and does anyone have any procrastination thoughts? What I like about this article is the way that it framed it. I had never really thought of that uh, in two ways. One, the subconscious, the primal, and the other half, the logical, and they're kind of fighting each other. So I thought that was a really uh, useful way to frame the problem and the solution. I was surprised that, I mean, I wasn't surprised, but I guess maybe that I thought I had better control over my logic, mm -hmm. and like I knew something had to be done, so I had to do it, and I'm gonna do it, and I don't do it. And I, I, I realized that, but it was, it was, a greater realization seeing it in print, like, oh, yeah, that actually happens. <laughs> <laughs> that struck me about this. Everything else made sense. Yeah, so three of us are in the process of thesis writing right now. Or yeah. not thesis writing. <laughs> and so this is just a right, right, right at home article. Um, I also really liked the uh, inciting emotion, and uh, he called it the playlist uh, to conquer worlds with. I thought that was fabulous, and that's something that I actually use a lot in my work. I like psych myself up and then tackle the thesis paper, and that's mm -hmm. been a good tactic. Me too. Yeah, it's always better to to write something mm -hmm. when like really epic music yeah. is playing. You feel like you're really doing something worthwhile yeah. then. Yeah. yeah. Fun little article. <laughs> Cartoons are worth looking at. It's interesting to see. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. Periodically, the American Theater Wing publishes a video series where industries, uh, industry professionals talk about issues of the day. Uh, Margaret, why don't you tell us about the latest one? Absolutely. So this was uh, hosted by Ben Cameron, um, and, uh, and it was an interview with uh, three, three folks who are uh, figures at, at regional theaters talking about uh, the, the main subject was about uh, measurement. They were talking about uh, this, this book called uh, Counting New Beans. Um, so it was about different ways to measure impact in the theater. Uh, and, and one of the points they brought up is that, that if you can articulate what you want to do, you can find a way to 
measure that, whether it's through asking your audience or, or talking to artists or, or whatever it is, that, that you can find a way to measure what you're doing. Um, and uh, the, the conversation was very wide ranging, but I think they covered some interesting ideas, especially in terms of audience involvement. Um, they, they talked about how the Wooster group uh, has this practice that they call dailies, where they have hired um, a filmmaker to come in every day and create a small film that they put up on their website and share with their audience. So people who follow them really feel like they have this window into the process. And so when they, when they come and see shows, they've seen part of the process and they feel like they know the people. Um, so, so there's that, that kind of involvement. Um, so was, was there anything in this article that, that people found particularly interesting or provoking or that you didn't agree with? One thing that I really had strong feelings against was, so they're talking about different ways to incorporate the audience into, mm -hmm. into the piece, to bring audiences to the theater, to make them more interested. Because uh, I think the reason behind it is no one goes to see theater for like the statistics. They mentioned, oh, you know, theater can help stimulate the economy. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's good for us to know, but audiences don't care about that. They go to see a story, a compelling uh, mm -hmm. piece of art. So one of the things that they were trying to do that was to invite audiences to technical rehearsals, um, which I think is a, a terrible, terrible, terrible idea. It's a, this weird world of hurry up and wait. We're working. We're working on the art, but we're not. We're working on other aspects of the art. Like, it's, it's just... I can't imagine anyone would find interest I, watching that, and I think I might actually scare people away from the theater. I think I might disagree with you there. Okay. Um, I, what is interesting to me is that I think, uh, for someone who has passion for theater, mm -hmm. that is not involved in it but pursues it, um, I think it would be a fascinating experience. I think I had, you know, if I was not in it, that would be something that I would like to go see as an audience member who cares about what's going on behind the scenes. They also talked about offering commentary. They have those headphones uh, that they use for uh, visually impaired mm -hmm. patrons mm -hmm. um, to, to have things uh, dis described to mm -hmm. them. Um, and so they said that sometimes they would use those and have someone, com like a sports commentator, mm -hmm. that was the model they talked about. <laughs> they did sort of, it's sort of like a play-by-play, -play, like, now we're holding for the sound designer to oh, set During levels. the tech rehearsal. During the tech rehearsal. That's fascinating. Which I think would be really yeah. sort of, I don't know you would want to do that for a 10 out of 12. No. But I mean, I I think for an hour or two, that would be really interesting. Yeah. It's like, oh, there goes that lighting designer who changes that cue, and there it goes, oh, hell, he's it. Yeah. Um, so that, you could make that interesting. It feels like they're trying to keep up with DVD extra yeah. features of the, how it's done and the commentary from the actors. And I don't like that. I think theater is wonderful what it is. It's a live experience. It's a one-time mm -hmm. shot. You're going to see a performance that will never be the same again. And to get too technical into it, I think yeah. it ruins the magic. I still disagree with you, though. Ruins I, the magic. I know that I'm a, you know, we're all special kind of nerds when it comes to theater, but <laughs> um, to me, the behind the scenes stuff is spectacular. I love it. I have loved it for a very long time, even before I was making my own theater. Um, and I think there's a lot of people that would, you know, flip to go backstage on any of these shows. Yeah, I think. Go ahead. Well, like, would, would it be, so like, we all know what it's like to sit in a theater and just be blown away, just yep. to have our heart ripped out, or mm -hmm. just, like, to, to laugh and cry at the same time. Like, we all know what that experience feels like. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to say that that energy doesn't exist in the backstage and the other things the audience doesn't see, but I think it might be less powerful for them. Like, it might turn into novelty, yep. which, you know, will be great for a little bit, and then those audiences will diminish. So this is kind of about mm -hmm. re-looking at what can we do at regional theaters to to make a more solid, longer lasting effort. Well, I think it's about finding the audience, the right audience for the show. Like if, if your audience is interested in this sort of thing, like the the audience for the Wooster group tends to be younger. They mm -hmm. tend to be uh, the, the type of folks who are interested in more interactive media, who are used to having some sort of participatory experience that don't want to just show up at, you know, guys and dolls and watch it and walk away. Mm -hmm. so, so it makes sense for the Wooster group to do something like this. I mean, Pittsburgh Opera, maybe not so much, but, mm -hmm. Um, but one of, the, one of the things that Wooly Mammoth talked about was audience design and getting the, especially the playwrights involved um, in, I, I, what was their question? They asked the playwrights, um, what is the conversation um, that you are trying to have with this play? Who needs to be in the room for that conversation to be meaningful? And so they try to design the audience um, the, the same way you would design the sound or the set, um, which I think is a really interesting thing. As a scenic designer, that is something that we're always conscious of, is what's the audience's relationship to the action on stage? So it's yeah. something that we probably need to think about more. Certainly something we need to think about. And I think we can all agree that we do need to try to find ways to bring audiences in yep. to make it better for them, make it more important to them. Come to uh, tech. <laughs> yeah. Maybe. We'll see. <laughs> also, help us strike. 
Oh, that'd be great. You know, that'd be great. Comes help us that'd be great. But then there's really. liability. We don't want to do that. We don't want to do that. We don't want to do it. <laughs> Another innovation that showed up on the Green Page this week was what they're doing with the Bay Area Bridge in San Francisco. So this was an article on the website Fast Company by Ariel Schwartz about an artist named Leo Villarreal who, okay, so in, if you have not been to San Francisco, there are two substantial bridges. There's a Golden Gate Bridge, which is red, and we all know that from A View to a Kill. There is also a longer bridge that connects Oakland straight to San Francisco called the Bay Bridge. Uh, and they have put, a, I don't know the number, a billion LED lights on 25, this. 25,000. 25,000. That's way less than a billion. So this artist has <laughs> done a piece of putting these twinkle lights. Some interesting technical aspects of this is that rather than put a standard chase of light sequence on it, he's using an algorithm. So of these lights, there's a, that's where the billion number came from. There's a billion combinations that won't repeat itself for two years. So I thought that was pretty interesting. So it takes $11,000 to power this thing. Another interesting aspect was they put the lights on the outside of the bridge to not distract the drivers who are driving through the bridge. And they said, the study was done, that this would bring $100 million into the local economy. So that is an interesting comment that I'd like to start with. I like the idea of twinkle lights on a bridge, <laughs> but I am not going to go to San Francisco just to see the twinkle lights. Uh, interesting how they think that's going to bring in this much money. I'll note that the organization who made that estimate is the San Francisco Arts Commission, and they are the chief fundraiser for this project. Mm -hmm. So, so that is a number slant. they came up with to convince people to give them. I'm not. I'm not saying I have no idea what the methodology was. Probably the methodology was very robust, and uh, this is a great number. Well, I imagine what, what we're experiencing is something uh, that we kind of hinted on in the last article, where so you look at the. The, the experience of going to the theater. So you go to the theater, you pay for parking. You also maybe have a, a bite to eat. Uh, maybe you go get a drink with your friends afterwards. Like right. that's all money that you spent that into the local economy. Mm -hmm. So maybe you you know drive past the bridge and pay a toll another time. Or maybe you go up here and sit at the cafe and look at that. So I think that's that number, which you can speculate. Does that really matter? Is that number real? Is it important? Um, but I think that's where that number comes from. What I think uh, is really cool is just what they're doing with the pixelation. Mm -hmm. And there's a picture on the website where you see the guy just sitting there with his laptop, like across the bay, just programming the bridge. Like I think that is wild that he can do this from his laptop to make that bridge do awesome stuff over there. It's also algorithm as art, which I think is fabulous. Yeah. So is this bridge a character now? Nope. It doesn't have feelings. It doesn't have feelings. <laughs> I would say it might be a character. <laughs> I don't know. It doesn't have a narrative. It doesn't have a narrative. No. <laughs> the Batmobile has a narrative. <laughs> it contributes to the narrative. But so does the bridge. You All right. Know, you know whose work, you know whose work I'm, doesn't have narrative? Thank you. Do it. <laughs> Robert uh, Wilson. Robert, Robert Wilson. Uh, <laughs> we're we're going to talk about Robert Wilson. This is an editor picked article um, called Robert Wilson's Theatrical Universe. Conveniently by Robert Wilson um, on, on limelight.com. Uh, so this is Robert Wilson, um, eminent theater director, discussing his uh, directing practice uh, in opera and his upcoming production of Three Penny Opera for the Berliner Ensemble. Um, so Robert Wilson, if you're not familiar with his work, kind of a big deal, um, you should probably Google him. Um, but he uses structural silences as a way to understand um, physicality and understand image. He often starts uh, his rehearsal process by having the actors go through uh, whatever the production is in silence and discover how to use the space um, and uh, their, their physicality. Um, he's a big proponent of uh, the idea that what's on stage in opera doesn't necessarily, doesn't necessarily have to illustrate what's happening. Um, you know, if you're singing about slaying a dragon, you don't necessarily need to be literally slaying a dragon because you're singing about it, so there's another way to convey it. Um, he also talks in this article about how that sort of abstraction is much more acceptable in dance and in visual art um, than in opera and, uh, and in theater. I mean, it's, it's something that's, that's accepted, I think, other places and different types of performance art practice, but uh, it's something that we are less, um, less willing to embrace, it seems, in, in the American world of, of theater and opera. Um, are you guys familiar with this practice? Did it seem... I, okay, I'm going to jump in because I'm a Robert right. Wilson nerd. Um, I saw the Three Penny Opera in Berlin two years ago, and it was one of the best shows I've ever seen, so I'll say that. Um, but I'm really, I've always loved Robert Wilson for uh, his ability to 
um, to separate the scenic design from the story. And he designs them separately, but then they come back together and they work. Uh, and I love this idea that um, the scenic design does not have to illustrate, does not have to show the audience um, what is happening on stage. I think that's a great approach and something that I really admire. Hold on, so what is the scenic design? Because I have been trained <laughs> that the scenic design serves, you read the script and you design well, a show to serve the story. And Robert Wilson does serve the story, but the difference is that his scenery does not always, ha rarely has a narrative to it. That is the difference. Um, that it supports the show perhaps emotionally, uh, but that the, the scenery is not telling you anything about what the action on stage. I will right. put you on the spot. Can you give us an example? Um, uh, in Wilson's work? Yes, of, of a scenery that's not serving the narrative. That's, that's not... What you're describing. <laughs> I mean, in Three Penny, Three Penny is a very architectural production. So Robert Wilson directed design this, this whole thing. Um, and it, it's architectural in a way that does not define location, but emotionally you know what's going on in that scene because of the way that it's structured. Does that okay, make sense? So it's a more emotionally driven than specifically detailed. Yes. Okay. It's more abstract. It's so more you're abstract. Not... You're not in the house, but you can feel what the characters are feeling like yeah. in the house. Mm -hmm. what, what we sometimes call that in class is putting a hat on a hat. Right. Um, you know, it's like, it's a hat. You put, you know, you don't need to. You don't need to because you have other ways to know what's happening, especially in opera where they're, you know, if it's the ring cycle, they're talking about what happened in the previous, so you get a lot of discussion about the plot. And so you don't necessarily need to show where you are. You can use the set to do something else a little more abstract. And I think there's, there's an element of the silence translating not only in the action of the characters, but also in the scenery. What, you know, what do you hold back on? What is, what is not represented, but still conveys the emotion? Yeah. Yeah. That was something that I was struck by was, I didn't quite understand it, but it made sense to me that to know that you can use silence to discover space was something so foreign to me because we always think about if there's silence on stage, something bad, is something, happening. something is, something's wrong. Yep. Or like it's, you're purposely trying to, you know, or tweak or irk something. So like the use sounds and space to discover geometry and architecture uh, was pretty profound and yep. really interesting. I like yeah. the concept of how he would do the run throughs, how the actors do a run without in silence and how if there was an aria that she would have to stand in that spot yeah. for five minutes. Mm -hmm. and I think that's a, as a former actor, that's just a powerful way to interpret and discover. Yeah. So and I would be interested, and this is why I love dramaturgs, and knowing this information, now I'd love to see one of his performances, knowing how this was created, and hopefully I can He's brilliant. You would, yeah, love interpret him this as, as well as you did. Right, and duration is that, that idea of duration and silence. So, so if you want an example of how he does this, check out his Voom portraits online, um, which are video portraits of celebrities. You can see um, Brad Pitt standing there in the rain with a water gun and just for like 12 minutes. Andy Warhol used to do this back in the day. Yeah, they're, so, so they're very Andy Warhol. Uh, yes, they're like a, a sort of a play on Andy Warhol. So check them out if you're interested in, in looking at Robert Wilson's art. Different kind of theater, certainly interesting. Uh, someone in Toronto is doing another different kind of theater. Uh, Lauren, why don't you tell us about what's going okay. on? So this is an editor pick from the Globe and Mail by Kate Taylor. And the article is titled, Can a Play with a Mentally Challenged Cast Be uh, Reviewed by Critics in the Standard Way? Uh, so Judith Thompson, who is a director and co-creator um, of this production of Rare, uh, this is a show in which nine actors with Down syndrome uh, talk about their lives realistically on stage. So the question here is, uh, what happens when you put uh, real people with uh, real marginalized people on stage to tell their truthful stories? Can you review that in the same way that you can a production of something else? Can, can you criticize a true story uh, in the same way? I read this article a couple weeks ago and I've come to the suggestion that yes, you can. can you? Critics should be allowed to. You can't say you can't do it, but I don't think you should. <laughs> like, I'm not going to say you're not allowed to, but I'm saying you shouldn't. My, well, my question is, what is the function of criticism? I think, I think a lot of the time in newspapers and in, in America, the function of criticism is to tell people whether or not to buy a ticket. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. so, so in that case, I, I understand why people are reluctant to, uh, to judge the merit of a production because they're afraid of offending people or, or whatever it is that they that they don't want to do because it's about in America it's about judging the merit rather than like discussing the implications or or whatever else criticism can has the ability to do. Uh, so I mean I guess really the question is what it what is it that you do as a critic and what prevents you from doing that with a production that has an element like 
like that's a true element. I mean, can you criticize performers that are, um, and I'm going to quote here, outside the standards of conventional theater the same way that you can uh, a regular stage performer? Is there a difference there? The suggestion, one of the suggestions in the article was that you, uh, that each production should be judged for how well it accomplishes its goals. So this production is not trying to be, you know, Spring Awakening or Newsies um, any more than Robert Wilson is trying to be Spring (laughs) Awakening or Newsies. So, so really, the I I think it's okay to judge um, judge a production based on what it's trying to do. It's just that this production has different goals that critics might not be familiar with or comfortable talking about. That's, that's my initial sort of thought um, is that, is that they, they're not quite, it's different and so it's scary. And th- yeah, and that's mm-hmm. why people are like, no, maybe we shouldn't touch it. But I think yeah. critic, critics can be comfortable talking about it when they think about what the form of the play is and what the mm-hmm. content of it is. So like, I don't know what the piece is about, the articles didn't say too much, but it's an ensemble of Down syndrome students uh, producing this piece, and so I don't know if it's a play about Down syndrome, if it's just a play about, you know, anything, or if it's like, you know, if, if they're doing, like I said, if you're doing Spring Awakening, or if a Down syndrome student's doing Death of a Salesman, then I think it's, it's the form doesn't mesh with the content, so mm-hmm. I, you should stay away from that. Um, well, Thompson also said that she, she herself believes that these students are artists and professionals, uh, and that she invites the criticism the same way that, that you would another production. Yeah. It's also way, I mean, I, I feel like this is not a rare thing in the world. Mm-hmm. In, in Europe, it's very common to use non-professional actors, um, especially to achieve uh, a certain result, um, depending on what you're trying to do. So I think I think this is, I know it's in Toronto, so not not the U.S. <laughs> but it, they're basically just one big American state. Sorry, Canada, it's true. Um, so, um, so it seems like the North American uh, way, way of doing this, we're a little more um, uptight about those distinctions than they are elsewhere in the world. So lighten up, North America. <laughs> yeah, here comes your review. Margot's reviewing the show. <laughs> These actors were terrible. It was... uh... And I think you can say that, but it's just the critics need to develop uh, an artistic language to criticize artfully. So I think there's that. There you go. Next article is uh, why you love that crooked Ikea table, uh, even if it's crooked. Uh, This was an NPR article uh, written by uh, Shankar Vindadam. Uh, This was a student pick. This was the highest picked article, commented on article this week. And it talks about the Ikea effect which is we all assume that uh, we do things for, that we love, right? So like we love something, so we're going to work really hard for it. That might not be what it is. So these uh, two professors, uh, Michael Norton from Harvard and uh, Dan Airely from Duke University, have sort of flipped it on its head, and they're discovering that it's actually the other way around. We love something because we work so hard on it. Um, so like, you know, you, the, the, the analogy being you go and you buy the Ikea thing in the flat cardboard box and like you take it home and, you, and that stupid wrench and nothing fits and everything's wrong and it's, but you're working so hard and you're so invested like you put it on, you put it in your room and you're proud of it. Even though you know it looks crappy and you know it's from Ikea and it's going to fall apart in a year anyway but like you did it so you are happy. Um, so there's that. Now something that I want to bring to the table is that this could also apply, they said, to ideas and intangible things as well. So if you're working on a project, if you're developing a presentation, if you're uh, writing something, you're putting a lot of work into it, and you might need to say, wait a minute, is this good? Do I love it because it's good, or do I love it because I'm frustrated with an Allen key? What do you guys think? Uh, you know, I feel that when, at least in the theater and in this building, I feel a lot of people create things, and then they hate it because they created it. Like very mm-hmm. self-loathing, like oh, I, you talk to a designer looking at their set, and they're gonna say, oh, that should have looked different. That should have been. That should have been over there. I wish I could have done more with that. And they don't. See, designer, I, what do you think? I disagree with you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, here's the problem: is that this kind of hits me on both levels. Is that yes, it is something that I physically created and an idea that has come out of my head. So I get really attached to my work. Um, sometimes to a point where it's difficult for me to step back and say, wait, this design really sucks. I need to throw this away. Um, there are times when I do want to go change things. Like in tech, I always want to change it. You know, it's never right. But I think the initial impulse is always something that I'm very protective of. I disagreed with the article because it was suggesting that people go to Ikea because they want to create. And they have the <laughs> urge to create, so they want to assemble their own furniture. No, they go to Ikea because it's cheap. And it's the <laughs> cheapest way to get your result. Um, I would much rather buy nice furniture made by a skilled craftsman than assemble my own. Well, 
that was that was the uh, the marketing aspect of the piece was that you know so is IKEA doing this purposely to get more people to buy their things because they know that this thing works psychologically and could other things do it and that's that's pretty that's very dismal to think about that to know that companies are manipulating the psyches of their you know mm -hmm. consumers to sell more product and but I don't know yeah, it happens but yeah I I think I would agree that something that you've worked long and hard on it's harder to let go of I mean I find as a director, if, if we have worked two hours on a sequence and then I have to cut it, mm -hmm. it's it's so painful. It's so painful to do, even even if everyone is to, like that. Even if I know, like in my heart of hearts, like that's not good. That's crooked. Like that is a janky ass sequence. You know, <laughs> like even because I've worked so hard on it, and especially you know, in, in my work, it's making other people work on it, right? So like I can't do anything by myself. It's making all these other four um, actors um, do. Uh, do all of that. So I, I think it is difficult to give something up that you've that you've worked on, or to to judge something harshly that you have worked really hard on. So I would I I would say I'm a believer in the IKEA effect. I would say I'm a believer too. And even though you know you might hate it, but I think the hate might actually be a sign of you know you work so hard on it and you're disappointed you're dis in it. So maybe maybe because the work is there, you can feel so strongly about it. So maybe maybe it's not love, but maybe it's. A deep emotional attachment. I'm to not it. mad, Matt. I'm just disappointed. Just disappointed. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I've, I've heard that once or twice before. <laughs> a lot of people were disappointed this year's Super Bowl. Something happened pretty big. So during the Super Bowl, did you y'all watch the Super Bowl? Yes. I listened to it on the radio. Super Bowl? I, I was watching down now. <laughs> That's the Yankees, right? Sure. <laughs> so in the second half of the Super Bowl, after the lovely Beyonce concert. Uh, the power went out for like 45 minutes. This is an article on a website called Art Technica uh, by Sean Gallagher, and this was chosen by the students, uh, explaining what happened there. So they were worried that they might have a power outage, so they very wisely went in and put a relay to prevent themselves from having a power outage, and what happened was the relay detected that there something incorrectly and then shut all the power down the system. So what they put in place to prevent this was the cause of what caught the 45 minute power outage, which it happens to me all the time in my world. The exact opposite of what I'm trying to do is what happens. Uh, so it was very frustrating. I wonder and why they just couldn't flip the relay the other way and turn the power back on if there was no real failure. They just thought there was a failure. A main thrust of the article was saying that it has nothing to do with Beyonce. I disagree so, with that. No, quit <laughs> blaming Beyonce because it was not. She's a superstar. She did it. It was not her okay. fault. We're, everyone wants to blame Beyonce. I think there's uh, great uh, implications to what we do technically because we talk about a contingency plan, right? So you don't want to use a contingency plan. The contingency plan is there just in case. And so they did it. They did their due diligence. They did a contingency. Yep. And you know the contingency plan mucked everything else up. Like. Thinking about it that way is this is horrific to think that like your due diligence is yep. not enough and you can never predict it. <laughs> That's scary. And the other thing that happened, which happens to me all the time, is they went back and they tested everything and they, they've used the system before and they can't make it fail again. It was just like a one-time mm -hmm. freak act. It was Beyonce's fault. Uh, I feel I empathize with the poor man that installed that relay and had to say, yeah, it was the relay, but I don't know why. Mm -hmm. But we cost everybody billions of dollars of lost ad revenue because <laughs> everybody went and watched Down Abbey yep. instead of waiting for the blackout to be fixed. How, how long was it? 35 minutes. 35 minutes? Could you imagine? I don't know if there's a, a stage manager or a production manager or a director of the Super Bowl, but could you imagine, like, what did that person do to get the power back on? I mean, 35 minutes to get everything back on, I think, I mean, kudos to that person. But I, can't, I couldn't imagine it, be, being in that seat. There's that sense of panic of like, oh, we can get this back on, and then 20 seconds go by, and then a minute goes by, and then all the athletes sit down, mm -hmm. and we go to commercials, and then the athletes start stretching to stay loose, and it just, just yeah. drew on yeah. forever. So, so working in, in live entertainment is, uh, is risky. It's risky. Things go wrong. It yeah, may, like, also makes me feel better that this is the Super Bowl. And if they can screw Biggest up, show of the year. They if they it can up. mess that up, yeah. I'm not going to feel so bad if I miss a yeah. spotlight. Cue. The Olympics, the Super Bowl, they all screw up, and it's, yeah. Our last article this week is a, a, an interview piece with uh, Marion Elliott, um, who's a director who works for the National Theatre in London. Yes, not a screw up, 
um, Marianne <laughs> Elliott. Uh, so this article is, is uh, Marianne Elliott, uh, Why Do Something That's Run of the Mill? It's by Lisa Kelly for The Observer. Um, as Matt said, uh, Marianne Elliott, Elliott uh, directs frequently for uh, the Royal National Theatre in London. She directed War Horse, Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime, um, and most recently Port. Um, she's also, uh, as we discussed last week when we were talking about uh, the prevalence of female directors in New York, Marianne Elliott is one of those six women, uh, only six women who have ever won a Tony. Um, she was a, a co-winner for War Horse. Um, so her her basic plan is that uh, when she when she wants to work on something, it needs to be something that is interesting or challenging. Uh, basically, because if if something's not an artistic risk, it's not worth taking personal risk for. Um, she's a mother. She has other stuff going on in her life, and if she's going to spend half her you know, half of her hours in a given week at the theater to work on something. It has to be something that she really believes in. And I thought that was a, an interesting way to look at um, prioritizing what, what sort of work you, um, you want to work on. So, so do you all have, have personal standards for, for the type of, of projects you like to take? Um, must it be, uh, if it's something that's run of the mill, do you refuse to work on it? Yes, I will never design Hedda Gabler. Fam famous last words. I'm probably going to get it soon. But, right. Yeah. Um, Someone's calling you right now with a job offer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, if I have a choice, I will not take Hedda Gabler. I will take something more interesting. I, Marianne Elliott is a Tony Award-winning director and now gets to choose what she That's works true. on. And she gets paid to do what she works on. And by paid, I mean paid, playa. Um, so I compromise all the time with what I work on, depending on how much I'm getting paid. Okay. Like, yes, I will do Annie three times in a row mm -hmm. if I can pay my bills and be home for dinner. I would, I would, I would sell out. Okay. But I'm at that point in my life. I'm sorry. Here's the thing is that if I'm going to design Hedda Gabler, I want to make it something that we've never seen before. If I have to do The Boring right. Show, I'm going to push it. Yeah, I, I think that fits into her definition of doing something not run of the mill. Right. So you can do Hedda Gabler, just right. turn it on its head and do something new with it. Right. And that's how she got famous, right, is not necessarily yeah. by always being given, like, the best material to work with, but by doing something unusual with it. So, I mean, I think making, as uh, to the degree that you can, making what you're doing something that you can be passionate about and don't want to procrastinate on, as long as it's not copyrighted by someone else. Oh, well, um, here's, <laughs> theater is so demanding. It takes so much of us personally that yeah. I think she's absolutely right. Why not see how far you can go with every production, even if it fails? Well, it's inspiring. I think it's, I wonder if it's a problem with American theater is this a is this a European idea? Like, because it seems to be like if you if every theater in the country did something that's not run the mill, if they took these chances, if they did this bold work, people would stop coming. Yeah, Maybe, but I don't know because I'm like there's a counterpoint too. Like, right, so everything she does is a home run. Right, she knocks out of the park every time. So is it? I guess a question for you guys: Is it a question that we see these pieces few and far between in America because Americans are afraid of taking risks, or because Americans are complacent? in their programming. I think the, uh, the biggest shows in America are uh, Phantom of the Opera and Wicked, and like kind of safe, simple shows. Well, and that's what we love. And that's, as a mass of theater people that want to pay money for theater. You can also say, though, like War Horse, you know, it's like storming the, the universe right now. Right. And uh, what's the one in uh, Sleep No More, right? So people are going all from across the country to see that. And those are, you know, that's not Phantom, that's not Wicked, that's not Guys and Dolls. It's there's absolutely a fine balance, though. I think we see this, you know, all over the country, is that you have to have the theaters that are doing Annie every year, and you have to have the theaters that are doing... Yeah, Christmas uh, Carol. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And you have to have the theaters that are, in contrast, doing Spring Awakening and the really groundbreaking work, I think. Yeah. So. so I guess it's just a matter uh, of finding your audience for, for the work is, that you're interested in working Is there any merit on doing something just because you enjoy it? Yeah, absolutely. Versus trying to push... Because doing, doing great theater and push it is hard. Like it's, it's yeah. really hard to take it out there and to can I just do a simple production because I enjoy it without having to reinvent it every time or having to yep. say where am I coming from? What if you can find people to see it, I mean, I, I think that's that's the question. Is there an audience for for what you want to do? If you're like, if I'm an artistic director programming something, and you know, maybe there is an audience to see Annie. But the question, well, like my question is, you know, who who is out there that wants to see this. I mean, I, I don't know that every artist has that question, but if, if you're programming in an institution, like in that theater wing interview that we talked about, you, you sort of think about, well, what is this, what am I, what conversation am I trying to mm -hmm. provoke with this, and who are the people, where is, where is the audience for this? Or maybe you should just do art for art's sake. I don't know. It's a question. There you go. 
perhaps, I don't know, it kind of takes us full circle, really, like talking about uh, what they theater wing, like, you know, how do we get these audiences and maybe it's the work that we do. Maybe we need more Marion Elliott's. I, yeah. I think we might do. Or maybe we just need more Batmobiles on stage. For sure we do. <laughs> for sure we do. Well, that's all the time we have for today. Thank you all so much for joining us. Uh, if you like what you see, tell your friends. If you don't, <laughs> tell your enemies. Oh, all right. nice. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Uh, good night. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Podcast. Podcast. <laughs> I gotta do more research. I keep up with.